Welcome to the Inner West Library's online speaker series. I would like to start by acknowledging the Gadigal and Wangal people of the Eora Nation on which this podcast has been recorded and pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging from across the lands. Sandy Docker grew up in Coffs Harbour and first fell in love with reading when her father introduced her to fantasy books as a teenager. Her love for fiction began when she first read Jane Austen for HSC, but it wasn't until she was taking a translation course at university that her Mandarin lecturer suggested she might have a knack for writing. It seemed of an idea that sat quietly in the back of her mind while she lived and travelled the world. Today I'm lucky to be speaking with the author of the Wattle Island Book Club, Sandy Docker. Welcome, Sandy. Can I start by saying that I love this book? It even made me cry. Spoiler alert, everyone. Can you give our listeners an introduction to the story? Sure. Before I do that, though, I, I want to say sorry for the tears, but I'm not actually sorry for the tears. Oh, I loved it. <laughs> because you know, as an author, our job is to make our readers feel some sort of emotion, whether that's joy or sorrow or humour. So the fact that you've had a reaction makes me, as an author, extremely happy. So thank you for that. Um, the Waddle Island Book Club is the story of Grace, who is a young librarian battling some personal issues. And she's contacted by Anne, who's the octogenarian matriarch of Wattle Island, to help her restart the Wattle Island Book Club. It's been going for about 60 years, the book club, but seven years ago it stopped suddenly. And as Grace gets to know Anne, she discovers that there's something big the island inhabitants just don't speak about. And she's determined to uncover that mystery and help the book club reignite. So she travels to Wattle Island to try to uncover the story. Together in what is you know, a fairly unlikely friendship. Anne and Grace have to work together to secure the book club's future and move past their own traumas. And I hope that it's a story that celebrates new beginnings and the power of literature and community and the fact that it's never too late to rewrite your story. The Wattle Island Book Club is your fourth book. How did it come about? Yeah, so I was actually on tour with my first book, The Kookaburra Creek Cafe, back when we were allowed to go on tour to libraries before the pandemic hit. And I was in Port Macquarie Library and I had just finished my event there and I was chatting to the librarian after the event. And she was talking about her own personal story and she was the inspiration for Grace, the character in the novel. And she was also talking about book clubs and how they'd really taken off in the area and that they even had a book club on Lord Howe Island, which she sent the box of books over to via the supply ship. And then I was driving to Coffs Harbour to my next event and the whole way in the car, my brain was just going ping, 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 an island, a book club. There's got to be a story in that. So I contacted the librarian afterwards and I said, look, I think there's a story here. Is it okay if I write it? And she gave me her blessing and that's where the book came from. I love the characters of both Grace and Anne. They are strong women, but also display great vulnerability and have experienced loss and hardship. These are such world-rounded characters, but it's almost as if to be strong, you need to have experienced pain and adversity. Do you believe this to be true? I don't know if you need to experience pain and adversity in order to be strong but I think it definitely adds layers of strength to you and I mean we've all had things in our lives once you've passed the age of 20 I think there's always something in your life that has made you dig in deep to a strength that maybe you didn't know that you had and so I think that's where the adversity and the pain helps you build your strength you know when you have to dig deep to get through those tough times helps build who you are and you know at the time we may not appreciate that and we certainly don't enjoy it but once you've moved through it you know you can look back at those moments and go right that's what helped me get through i agree that both grace and Anne had trauma that they needed to work through and it was buried quite deep so they definitely needed to draw on their strength before they could move on and get on with the rest of their lives sandy As Grace heads off to Waddle Island for an adventure, she manages to cross off some things from her bucket list. Do you have a bucket list that you are currently working your way through? I don't have a physical bucket list written down that I'm ticking off like Grace does. She keeps an entire journal of her bucket lists in there, but I've got plenty of things that I want to achieve, you know, before it's too late. And it's, you know, some of it's to do with travel, which obviously we can't do at the moment, you know, like cross Canada via train, that sort of thing, go on safari in Africa. Uh, I want to learn another language. I want to learn the cello, which I'm trying to convince my husband to let me do at the moment, but we'll, I'm, still, I'm still working on that one. <laughs> I'm not sure if taking up cello during a pandemic where you're locked in is a good idea or not, but I'll leave that up to you. <laughs> Maybe when you 
have, have a bit of separation between the two of you, might be a bit of a chance to start something like a cello. <laughs> yeah, maybe not the best timing. Yeah, well, hopefully that won't be too much further away, but yeah, I'll keep that in mind. Sandy, when I was preparing for this interview, I came across some interesting information about your writing process. You have a bit of an old school approach to your writing style. Can you tell us a little bit about your process? Yeah, so when I wrote my first two novels, The Kookaburra Creek Cafe and The Cottage at Rosella Cove, I actually wrote those pen and paper, longhand, the old fashioned way, destroyed I don't know how many trees in the process to do that. And I love writing by hand. There's something about that process that I think just takes you to a different place in your mind. Since I've been under contract with Penguin though, my deadlines are a lot shorter and I have to go straight into the computer now. I still edit via hand though, because again, I just there's something different about holding that pen in your hand, I think. Sandy, when you have finished writing pen to paper and it comes time for you to go online, do you type exactly what you've written or do you change the story as you're typing? Yeah, so at every stage, whether I'm writing it first by hand or typing it first and then editing by hand, every chance that I'm going back into that manuscript, I'm editing absolutely. And, you know, I've never actually counted how many different drafts I've done for each of my books. But, you know, I'm editing things probably 10, 15, 20 times before the final product goes to shelf. How much research do you need to do when you're referencing real events and trying to convey the mood of a time? For example, how people treated Tadashi as that happened in the 1940s and 50s after World War II. Also referencing Japanese cultural ways, for example, kintsugi, cooking and eating sketches. Yeah, I always end up doing more research than I think I have to do. And, you know, when we're talking about things like World War II, which is the historical part of the story that we go back into, you know, we're taught about these things at school, but we're only taught the big picture stuff. We're not taught those finer details and those personal experiences. So, yeah, I I had to do a fair bit of research on that. And what I found was really interesting about Tadashi's story is that not a lot of Australians realise that we interned foreign civilians during World War II. They went into concentration camps, essentially. And there was, you know, I think 2,000 um, Japanese Australians that were interned during the war. And the majority of them were then sent back to Japan. And so I had to research what that was like, why they all got sent back, the ones that were allowed to stay, why were they allowed to stay. So I had to contact a museum and they put me through to a professor up in Queensland who definitely helped with all of that. Um, and that's that's the hard slog research, you know, particularly when you can't find what you're looking for on the internet. But then there's the fun side of research and you mentioned Kintsugi Sophia and that's the Japanese art of mending broken pottery with gold. Yeah, I actually did a course in it too so that um you know i I explained it to my husband well i have to do it for research but i just wanted to do it for fun (laughs) and um, and i've actually got a piece of pottery now that i have mended with gold and going through that process of of how sam would do it in the story was a really um therapeutic way for me to get inside his head i guess that's beautiful that you were able to do the kintsugi workshop and you made you feel closer to sam i also appreciate that even though this book is a book of fiction it is based on history And I actually got to learn a bit of history myself. I wasn't aware of how the Japanese people were treated after World War II here in Australia. The characters in this book are so vibrant. I honestly couldn't pick a favourite. It was a bit like trying to choose a favourite child. As an author, Sandy, do you develop favourites as you're writing and the characters have revealed themselves to you? And are you ever tempted to give your favourites the best storylines and better dialogue than the other characters? I mean, thankfully my characters can't hear me when I answer this question because (laughs) you kind of do get favourites as you go (laughs) along. Uh, They'll never know that. Of course, in my head, I treat them all equally. Uh, But yeah, I loved Anne in this story. Anne's our octogenarian matriarch of the island and she's got such a rich history and she's such a beautiful personality. I really, really enjoyed her. As to whether I give them the best storylines or dialogue, I'm not actually in control of that. And I know that sounds really crazy, but the characters are in control of that. You know, in the writing process, they tell me what they want their story to be and 
what their interactions are going to be. And I think one really good example of that, particularly in the Waddle Island Book Club, is the character of Hamish. When, when Hamish was first on the page, he was just going to be the old dude on the island who plays the bagpipes at sunset. And that was pretty much his role at the very beginning. And then as I was writing the story and developing it, I realised that he had a bit more to say and he was far more important to Anne than I realised that he was going to be. And he has one of my favourite lines in the whole book where he's talking about uh, setting your pain free and giving it wings. And I knew I didn't see that coming. So, you know, somebody who was supposed to be just a very, very minor character ended up playing a really huge role in the story. Sandy, as you're writing your manuscript, do you know where your characters are going and how the story will end? Or do you just let it write itself? I have no idea when I'm going when I start, Sophia. I wish I did. It would be a much easier process if I was somebody that meticulously planned out and knew where I was going right from the start. But I'm not. I usually have like one scene in my head. In this particular story, it was, you know, the box of books on a boat heading over to an island. And I start writing and, and I feel my way through. And I'm always surprised where my characters end up taking me. But I think that works really well because it does take the readers along for the ride and it's not predictable. Um, there were so many times that I thought I knew what was going to happen and then I was pleasantly surprised. So I think it's a really effective way of writing. Yeah, thank you. And and look, every writer is different. There are some writers who thrive with meticulous plans and there are other writers like me and then there's a whole bunch of writers in the middle as well. You, you've got to do what works for you as a writer. For me, that works. I love not knowing where I'm going in that, you know, the, the story is a surprise for me. And I think if I was to try to plan things, I'd kind of box myself into a corner and I wouldn't know how to get out. So I, I like it that way. But yeah, every, every writer is different and, and you've got to do what works for you. There are many episodes of sadness in this book, but ultimately it is a book of hope. And whilst this works brilliantly as a standalone book, I was left wanting to know what happened to the characters after the story ended. Do you have any plans to write a sequel? I love that you want to stay with the characters after that final page. That that means I've done my job properly. So that's a huge compliment. Thank you so much, Sophia. Um, as for a sequel, I've never planned to write a sequel, but I'm also a never say never kind of person. I think there's a bit of a danger, though, in sequels if you don't originally set out to do it that way. And that is, I can imagine that, you know, because you've connected so well to these characters, Sophia, you have an idea of what you want to happen next for them, right? I do, but I'm also happy to be um, surprised. But what if I do something completely different and I take them in a direction that you hate? You're going to hate me after that if I write a sequel. No, only for, only for a minute. <laughs> only for a minute. But, you know, we'll realise that, you know, that's how they had to go. As you said, you know, your characters unwind in mysterious ways. And I think ultimately that's life. So when you're reading, you do want to get lost in the book. You don't want to think you're reading. You want it to be just a total escapism. But I'd be happy with ever which way you went. Put that in your little arsenal and just remember that, you know, if you want to do a sequel, you'll have at least one person going, yay. <laughs> yay. <laughs> But I have had readers contact me and ask for sequels on the other books. This one's only just come out, so I haven't had that contact yet. But I can't remember which one it was. I think it was the Ro Cottage at Rosella Cove. I had a reader contact me and say that she wanted a sequel and this is exactly what she wanted to happen in the sequel. And I was going to go, yeah, but that's not what I'd do. And so I just, I don't know. As I said, never say never. Maybe we'll leave that up to... You know, the movie rights, if somebody buys the movie rights to the Waddle Island Book Club, they could turn it into a series and take it beyond where the book finished. There's an idea. <laughs> Here's to hoping. I must mention that it was lovely to see Grace the Librarian featured as a main character. We don't often get a mention. What do libraries mean to you? Yeah, Grace is a wonderful main character. And, and as our librarian, she brings so much to the story. Libraries are, oh gosh, they're amazing places, aren't they? Because... It doesn't matter what your age, your gender, your socioeconomic status, your race or religion is, there's something for you in a library, in a really safe place. And I love that. You know, it's not just about books, although as an author, I think that's a fabulous part of a library. But it's also, it's also about community groups and study groups. And, and in Wattle Island, the library uh, in Port Madison not only hosts writers groups and book clubs and children's story time, which is what you would probably expect to see in a library, but they also have puzzle groups and the historical society meets in there. 
and it's such a wonderful way to connect with the community in a way that, he, that goes beyond books. So I just, you know, there's a beautiful relationship with a library and the community. And I think it's fantastic that, you know, I could highlight that in this book. I mean, currently we're in a horrible situation with COVID and yet here we are doing a podcast over the phone and you're able to share your new book with people who can't come into the library at the moment, but we'll be using our library services and our online services to listen to this podcast and connect with you. So we do appreciate that you appreciate that libraries are a fantastic place. And if you think about that click and collect service and a lot of certainly the metro libraries are doing it i know all of the libraries near me are as well for a lot of people who are in lockdown that might be their only way to connect to the outside world so imagine if that wasn't there it's just such a valuable service absolutely the wattle island book club is a great book for those looking for a good holiday or beach read do you have any recommendations for our listeners yeah so obviously i read a fair bit uh you know because I enjoy it, but also for my job. I've just recently finished Maya Linnell's Magpie's Bend, which is a rural romance. And that was a real kind of a warm hug of a book that I really enjoyed. I read a lot of historical fiction as well. And Tanya Farrelly's The Eighth Wonder is one of the best historical books I've read in a long time. That's a fantastic read. And I'm lucky enough that I actually get sent advanced copies now uh, from other authors. And I have Joanna Nell's book that comes out, I think it's the end of this month it comes out, which is The Tea Ladies of St. Jude's Hospital. And I've just started reading that. And it's a very typical Joe book, you know, that's got a lot of warmth and humour and I'm loving it so far. Um, Just from the title, I think it'll be something that I'll definitely read. Sandy, are you currently working on a new book? Yes, I just, um, I'm on deadline now for my next year's book, which is going to be called The Red Gum River Retreat. Uh, And there is a cellist in there, which is another reason why I want to learn the cello. So and I can speak with some authenticity about it. Sandy, how do you choose your titles? It's lovely to see a common theme connecting all your books. Yeah, that was actually a publishing decision. So when I first signed with Penguin, the Kookaburra Creek Cafe and the Cottage at Rosella Cove were both finished manuscripts, but they had very different titles. And when I went in for my first meeting with Penguin and they said, look, you know, we love your work, et cetera, et cetera, but we can see a different brand for you. How do you feel about these titles? So they actually came up with those first two titles. And then to stay on brand, which I hate using that term because I'm a writer, I'm not, you know, a product, but but that's the term we use uh, on brand then I've fit to the titles to my other books, you know, to, mit, to fit that. Sandy, I think it's fantastic how your titles of your books have all a reference to an Australian theme. It's nice and easy for people to know that you're an Australian author. I think it was a fantastic idea by Penguin to come up with that theme. Oh, no, I, I love the titles and the covers that they've come up with that go with them as well. They're just such gorgeous, striking covers again that's completely the publisher I've, I've got nothing to do with that um, but I love it and you know you walk into a library or a bookshop and you know that that's a Sandy Docker book absolutely it's like a, you'd actually pop it in a frame and it'd be a nice photo yeah it would it would Sandy after reading your four novels I will be prepared when you release your next novel next year and have my tissue box ready to go I'm pretty sure I'll need it <laughs> I can't promise anything. I'm, I'm not far enough into it yet to know how that's going to go. But um, we'll I've been really conscious of, of trying to, you know, make sure there is some diversity there in, in my books. And also, you know, that the hero isn't always just six foot four tall, hunking, six pack, you know, kind of guy. But because, I mean, that's not real, right? That is why I love the characters of both Grace and Anne. They're both so different, different age groups, different experiences. Both ladies have a great strength, and in marrying Tadashi, which was not the done thing in that era, and Grace having the strength to decide how she wants to live her life. Both great hero characters. Thank you for bringing them to life. Oh, thank you. That means a lot for you to say that. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time, Sandy, and it was a wonderful chat. We wish you all the best with your new book and look forward to all your future publications. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. If you would like to purchase any of Sandy's books, call on your favourite bookstore or go online. Look out for upcoming digital content through the Inner West Libraries, What's On and social media channels. Inner West Council Libraries have an extensive collection of Australian authors, both in physical and digital format. Thanks for listening, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.